uh, genome is um, comprised of um, a large part of coding DNA, uh, which is the blow, uh, so very small fraction of coding DNA that codes for proteins. Um, and this uh, small fraction of, uh, of, of, of pro, uh, small fraction of our DNA harbors, uh, the, uh, or harbors a large part of the very ge genetic variations that we have as individuals. So you can see the ver genetic variations in each of us as sort of a fingerprint of our identity. The problem with this genetic variations is, in, in, in particular, in this small fraction of our genome, is that it harbors 85% of known uh, uh, disease variations. And the majority of the genetic variations are rare, so they have a less than 0.5% allele frequency. Um, and the impact of most of these variants is unknown. So here's a, a plot showing the number of variants of uncertain clinical significance as a function of year uh, indexed in the ClinVar database managed by, by the National Institutes of Health in the US. And we can see that the, with this increasing um, uh, uh, genomic sequencing efforts, we are discovering more and more variants that cannot really be classified because they are too rare to be classified using traditional GWAS methods, so as, as I will outline next. So basically what is happening in a genetic variant is uh, in, 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 the, in the exome is that a protein is modified somehow, so there's a transition from one protein to a different protein sequence, which uh, manifests itself at the atomic scale as a modification of an amino acid. This in turn propagates into the molecular scale, so it alters the thermodynamic and kinetic properties of, of the protein molecule. So for instance, it alters the free energy landscape of what the protein actually does, what it binds to or its function. And this in turn can change uh, or affect the functional scale of the protein. So for instance, it can lead to a loss of function, gain of function, or it can be a neutral mutation. So, and this in the end can propagate into the phenotypic scale, for instance, uh, leading to uh, obesity or other types of uh, diseases uh, or disease states. So the traditional way of, of classifying these variants as, uh, is, as, um, as you probably know, uh, is these uh, uh, genome-wide association studies where we try to associate some phenotypic readouts or some uh, class of a, a co uh, class of a subclass of a cohort to a specific genetic variants on a sequence level. So we basically take a top-down approach to the problem. Um, the problem is that, at, as I've outlined, is that with very rare genetic variants, we will require extremely large cohorts to get statistical st st statistically significant um, associations between these genetic variants and the phenotypes. The alternative approach is to do a bottom-up approach where we try to model everything from the bottom up. So the, the problem with this approach is, uh, so the advantage of this approach is that it's mechanistic. So it's general. We will, if we have such an approach, we will be able to use it for any disease in principle. Um, the problem is that it's not computationally tractable to do. And this is why we have largely ignored this. And we have thought that this is sort of like a cute idea, but we cannot really do this in practice. So the, the main obstacles that keep us from actually approaching this problem is uh, one of them is the so-called sampling problem, where we, where we need to explore the different conformational uh, states that a protein has available to itself. So that is, uh, for instance, illustrated here by a protein that can adopt multiple different conformations. And when we do a simulation of the protein, we, uh, we are essentially only exploring a very small fraction of the possible configurations of the protein. A different Problem is that the models that we have available to actually describe the protein ensemble, they are, uh, are not accurate. So here, there's a discrepancy between the, the actual uh, protein energy landscape, so the different conformations that it can uh, uh, adopt, and the energetic, uh, uh, so the relative free energies, and then the ones that we maybe sample in either experiments or in a simulation. And then there's the problem of scale, which is probably the biggest problem that we can currently target relatively small molecular systems or complexes, uh, whereas most of the systems that we are interested in on a biological scale uh, go way beyond what we could currently do. And then there's the problem of uh, transferability. So once we have done a simulation on one system and we've paid uh, uh, years of computational simulation time, these insights will not 
be useful for just a slight variation of the chemical system. So if we do an, a point mutation in, the prote in a protein and we want to do this bottom-up approach again, then we will have to do the same expensive calculation for, for, the, uh, for, the, for the whole system again. And this is uh, where I usually say in the talks, uh, can machine learning help to target, target any of these problems? Can we speed up any of these problems or sort of bridge to larger scales with, these, uh, with, with the technologies that machine learning makes available. But in reality, machine learning has a lot of the same problems. So there's a, the, the fundamental problems of sampling is uh, known as generative modeling in, in statistics and machine learning. And the accuracy of models is also a problem, which is generally, uh, see, uh, 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 there's a dual, dual problem in, in statistics known as uh, predictability. And uh, another problem that is also the same in, uh, or sim there's a similar problem in, in machine learning and, and AI is scalability to large uh, de deployment to large scale data sets. And then there's finally the, the problem of transferability, which is analogous to domain uh, adaptation. So, um, so, so really my argument here is that there is hope because there's now a very big push in the AI machine learning field that we can actually make some efforts because there's a lot of, uh, technologies that are being developed with other applications in mind. And uh, going on this, uh, going uh, with the stream of, of these new technologies, there will be uh, ample opportunities to uh, move towards this. So I've been personally working in this direction for uh, uh, several years now. Uh, my, my main focus has been on integrating experiments with molecular simulations to improve the accuracy problem. So improve the computational models we have of protein structural dynamics. Another uh, big area is improving the sampling strategies, sampling methods that we have available. So we can, uh, we can explore the different confirmations that are available and identify hopefully functionally relevant conformational states. And then in the end, applying these methods in collaboration with experimentalists to study intermolecular processes. So uh, I have to say this last publication down here is actually uh, in press now, it was accepted in PNAS this week. So uh, we are very happy about this. But uh, today I will only be talking about these two studies that are from last year that really illustrate more of a machine learning approach. So the first, uh, work is joined with Frank Noé, and this was funded by the previous postdoctoral funding that I had. So the basic problem that we are faced with when we are studying protein dynamics is basically that we want to explore the, the state of possible conformations. And we want to be able to get a model of the time scales that are involved with transitioning between different conformational states. So if we look at this two-dimensional plane here, then every, every point in this plane can be seen as a protein conformation. And what we are interested in studying is the so-called propagator. And basically what the propagator tells us is how, if we have an initial condition, so a distribution in this space, that would correspond to the uh, probability distribution of possible conformational states, how this evolves over time. So we want to be able to get a description of this high dimensional, actually infinitely dimensional uh, statistical object that describes the dynamics of our system. The way that we typically approach this problem is basically by discretizing this extremely high dimensional space of possible conformations and counting transitions between the states that we have observed in parallelized simulations. So for instance, we deploy um, we start simulations from multiple different configurations and count transitions between them and build a Markov model where we simply uh, count transitions between these uh, uh, discrete bins on a, this high dimensional space. Uh, this approach is very, has been very su successful and because it gives us access to, once we have access to this Markov model, we get access to the thermodynamics, kinetics and important structures that are. The, the problem with this uh, approach is that it relies on uh, us being able to do a low rank approximation of the model. That's the mathematical way of putting it. But what this means is that we are relying on having only relatively few configurations that we need to sample to be able to do this in a tractable manner. And it basically comes down to that we only need a relatively few to sample relatively few rare events that take a long time to sample in the molecular simulations. So the statistical trick is basically this. We have a high dimensional space. We have a lot of initial conditions, 
but most of the degrees of freedom, they, they are relaxing in the simulation. So they, they take, they are not difficult to sample and only a few of them take a, a long time to sample. And in those exact cases, we can use this uh, approach uh, very successfully. And this, what it boils down to is that when we do an eigenvalue decomposition of this matrix, uh, so this uh, Markov model, there will be relatively few of the, of the eigenvectors that have eigenvalues that are close to one. Okay, and this, in this case, we can apply these methods. The problem in, in practice is that we have highly frustrated systems where there are a lot of eigenvalues that are close to one. And then this approach largely breaks down because we will simply need to simulate for too long to be able to do anything useful with this uh, way of approaching the problem. And in this case, the approximation doesn't uh, uh, breaks down and we need to sample a lot more transitions. So to be able to get at this problem, so also to be able to illustrate a bit more this problem explicitly, let's take a look at this cartoon of the ribosome. Let's just do the thought experiment that we have uh, 12 different subsystems in this, in this uh, molecule. So if every, uh, and, the, and the global state of the whole ribosome is represented by S, every state of the subsystem is described by a, a a, a, a multinomial variable sigma one to sigma 12. And, um, and if we say that every of these subsystems can adopt two states, so they can either be on or off, say, then the whole global system can adopt two to the 12th different states, around 4,000 states. If we have three states and we have half a million different states, and you can see how, how this goes, right? So this is really illustrating how this approximation breaks down. Uh, of course, given that these exchange on a relatively slow time scale, but it also opens an opportunity because we can then, instead of modeling the global states, we may be able to get away with modeling the, the transitions in the local states and how they interact with each other. And this is the core of this dynamic graphical models idea that we presented uh, last year, where instead of modeling the protein uh, uh, dynamics here illustrated by this cartoon where we move between different states of, of conformations and where we in the Markov state modeling approach, the, so the, where we partition the whole configurational space, we move in between uh, global, instead of moving in between global states, we model how the individual subsystems of the molecule, they change over time. So instead of modeling the transition probabilities, so counting transitions, we are modeling how the systems interact with each other over time. So in the end, what we at, uh, arrive at, instead of a Markov model, which is extremely high dimensional, so for instance, a million times a million, we arrive at a, a, a relatively small system, a small model that only models how these subsystems, they, uh, they behave in the field of the other subsystems, okay? So we don't need to model all the interstate transition probabilities explicitly, but we can still make use of the same data that we've uh, observed before. So um, maybe I will skip through this math quickly because uh, I can see that I'm already running on short on time. Uh, so basically it turns out it's a very easy problem to solve mathematically. And the question is now whether it works. So it corresponds to modeling, uh, solving, uh, several logistic regression problems or multinomial regression problems. Uh, and the question is whether, whether this works. So we compare it first to on a small peptide system to a, a, a Markov state model where we, where we are able to uh, exhaustively sample this easily. And we show that the prediction of the, of the thermodynamic properties uh, between the traditional approach and the dynamic graphical modeling approach, which we call this new approach is, is very comparable. So we, we get very good agreement between, the, the, between the, the, the predictions of the thermodynamic properties. So this is the relative probabilities of the different states, but also the time scales. So the kinetics of exchange between the different states, we also get right. And, and this is, and the, the main point here is that in the one, in the, in the case of the Markov state model, we have tens of thousands of parameters. Whereas in the dynamic graphical model, we have tens of parameters. So we are doing a, a significant compression of the physical dynamics of the system by using this different representation of the dynamics. Okay, and another interesting property of these models is their generative, pro uh, is their generative uh, um, 
so that the, the fact that they are generative. So we can, in principle, simulate states that we have not seen during the uh, simulation of the training data. And to test this, we looked at two protein folding data set that have pre previously been published, where we identify respectively five and four different meter stable states. And then we generate uh, training data sets where we, in each case, filter out one of the states during training and then we test during testing we test whether we can actually reproduce this state or we can detect this state and indeed we can do this so here i show the log probability of the different states in a reference hidden markov model which is equivalent to a markov modeling so the traditional approach and the dynamic graphical modeling approach and where there's the star over the bar plot the state has not been seen during the training of the dynamic graphical model, but it has been seen during the training of the, of the hidden Markov model. So we see in general that within statistical uncertainty, we are able to detect the existence of the state. And in many cases also with quantitatively accurate statist uh, or statistical weights. So the thermodynamics are also predicted extremely well with this approach. And this is again, a model that relies on way fewer parameters than the other approach. Okay, and so we can also predict the kinetics uh, in these cases, but we tend to over predict time scales. So things happen too quickly. And this is not so incredibly surprising because we have, uh, we, we, don't, we don't observe specific events uh, and we generally undercount uh, or overcount certain transitions in, in that case. So, um, so this, there's room for improvement, but uh, but I think that this, it, the fact that we can reproduce the thermodynamics uh, of states that we have not seen is already quite interesting. Okay, so let's move on to the second project that I will talk about today, which is uh, Boltzmann generators, which is a joint work again with Frank Noé, Jonas Köhler and uh, Hao Wu. And this was also funded by uh, the Humboldt Foundation and was recently highlighted uh, on faculty 1000. I think it's renamed actually now. Um, so the, the idea again is the sampling problem that I outlined it before, where we want to basically draw samples from a statistical distribution where we don't have a normalization constant. And this distribution is defined by an energetic potential function U of X, which is our potential energy model of our molecular system. For instance, a protein, how the different atoms interact with each other. So we have two general methods of doing this. One is molecular dynamics, where we typically have highly correlated samples because our delta T of integration is, really, is very small, or we can do Monte Carlo, where we, where we either have the low acceptance, uh, a low acceptance uh, problem, or we have highly correlated samples because we similarly move, uh, make extremely small Monte Carlo moves. So in the field of AI, as you probably know there's been this big revolution in generative modeling where we can map some latent space variable, which is, a, for instance, a high dimensional Gaussian distribution into a high, highly defined structured images, uh, such as the photo of this dog or butterfly or hamburger. And um, so th the idea is basically that we map this uh, uh, distribution that is easy to sample from through a neural network that is trainable into a, into a distribution that is otherwise difficult to, to sample from. For instance, a data space where a data, a data point is a photo or some other complicated object, uh, object that is complicated to generate uh, uh, without having access to a photo camera, for instance, okay? So the question is, what if we, instead of having this to be a distribution of images, what if this was the Boltzmann distribution? So the Boltzmann distribution is the exponential of the minus, uh, so this distribution here that I outlined here. So the minus exponential of beta u of x, or u of x is our potential energy function, okay? So that was the fundamental question that we asked in this research project. Then we will have a situation like this. We generate some noise, we pass it through a neural network and we get back a protein confirmation that is somehow physically valid. Okay, and then, so the, so the idea is then, okay, uh, we then have a transformation of variables again from X, uh, from, from Z to X through a neural network. Uh, and the problem here is of course that unlike in the case with, for instance, images, we don't have a lot of data available to us because we don't have samples from Boltzmann distribution of the system that we're interested in, okay? Because if we already had that, 
then we wouldn't have a problem. The, the problem is that we want to generate samples from that space. Okay, so we, so, uh, but the thing that we do have access to is the potential energy function. And that's something that you traditionally don't have access to in machine learning applications. You don't have a, a, a you don't have a model that tells you whether or not, uh, or you don't have an, a physically accurate model that tells you whether a photo is realistic or not. You have uh, maybe a different model that was trained on data that tells you something like this, where you don't have a, sort of mechanistic model that describes the, uh, what constitutes a good image, okay? So this is something that we have access to because we are studying a problem in the natural sciences and, and physicists have been working on this problem for many years, okay? So, so in order to be able to train using this model, so this potential energy model, we need several properties of, of this, tra uh, this uh, variable transformation to be fulfilled. The first thing is that we will need to be able to have an invertible transformation Okay, so we need to be able to go from Z to X and from Z and from X to Z. So we need to have a, a, a mapping which is invertible. Most neural networks are not invertible. Um, they are nonlinear functions that cannot be inverted. And the other thing that we should be able to do is we should be able to compute the Jacobian of the variable transformation, both forward and backwards. And one particular architecture that satisfies this property is the real MVP. Uh, architecture, which I will not discuss here, but it's outlined here what, what essentially what this, what this method does. It breaks it into uh, inver uh, piecewise in invertible transformations and, and sort of shuffles the variables around. Uh, and by composing these, you can build very complicated distributions that are uh, complicated transformations that are invertible. Okay, so what we then end up defining uh, as, as a loss function is uh, not a typical uh, maximum likelihood. We actually also have a maximum likelihood in case we have data. But the interesting loss that we are, we are working with is, is defined as follows. And this is a kulbach leibler divergence between our Boltzmann distribution and the generated distribution that we are generating with the model. So basically what this is, this first term, uh, the first thing is an expectation in our latent space. And this is basically we pass through our samples uh, generated samples through the neural network. The output of this f of theta is a protein confirmation and we evaluate the potential energy of this. And then we subtract the logarithm of the determinant of the Jacobian of the variable transformation. This tells us, uh, us how much we are stretching and compressing the space of the prior distribution in the latent space. As, so this act is a sort of an entropic term. And in total, because we're taking an expectation of our distribution, what these two terms end, out, end up being very similar to, uh, sorry, is a free energy, which is exactly a thermodynamic property that we are familiar with from, from statistical physics or from thermodynamics. So it's, it's not a, a Gibbs free energy, but it's a Helmholtz free energy that it's analogous to. And another, there's also another, there's also a number of other physical interpretations of this that has, has, has later on been, been dis discussed in the literature, but I will not discuss it here. So the question is really, okay, skip to this. How does it work on, on simple toy systems? It works, uh, it works very well on small, on well, very toy, uh, small, on small toy systems. For instance, there's two well potential here. We can generate samples in a two dimensional space and we can directly uh, pass them through the neural network and they end up being sam realistic samples in the configurational space. And we can also see that if we generate, have points at the high energy barrier, they fall in, a, in between the blue and the red points. So this suggests that we can do a latent space interpolation. So we can move in the latent space easily and make transitions between uh, uh, we can make realistic paths between low energy energy uh, states uh, in our system. So uh, traditionally uh, doing a, for instance, a Monte Carlo or a molecular dynamic simulation, a potential like this, this, this simulations would traditionally spend a lot of time in these minima, and then they would occasionally jump over the barrier and go into the higher energy state and then jump back and forth. But here we can sample IID from this distribution with this approach. And the same holds for this, uh, um, for this other uh, Muller potential down here. And again, we can, do inter uh, we can do interpolation in latent space between low energy samples and find physically realistic paths uh, between the different states. 
And we can also use this to generate molecules. So we generated uh, uh, BPTI protein molecules one shot where we are sampling we can see here a histogram here, which is, I think, the most interesting plot from here is that we, we the generated distribution blue here overlaps with an empty simulation in terms of potential energies. So we are sampling energetically realistic conformations. And they also have realistic geometries. So we are placing basically 3,800 uh, XYZ coordinates in one shot. So we are sampling them independently and identically distributed according to the Boltzmann distribution using this approach, okay? We are sampling uh, transitions between conformations that are, have previously been reported to exchange on millisecond time scales. And this is something that we could, I could do on my old laptop, which I have here, which is now six years old, instead of using a supercomputer that ran for a year. So this is uh, pretty spectacular, okay? Um, and here I will show some, some examples of some samples from the distribution. So this just looks like a jumpy uh, uh, like a protein NMR structure, but in reality, the sampling tr transitions that are normally, uh, normally it would stand still in one state for a very long time, and then it would occasionally jump to the other state. But we can really see that it's, it's doing this isomerization um, uh, around, the, around the disulfide. Uh, very rapidly and very efficiently. So we can sample the thermodynamics of the system very efficiently, compute experimental observables and compare them uh, with way less computational effort. Of course, once the model is trained. So with this, I would like to thank the collaborators on these projects, um, the previous funding and the current funding. And then I would like to draw your attention to that I have two positions open, PhD positions. And if anybody's interested, please reach out. Um, if you're interested in working on projects such as these and looking forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you.